Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Navroop Sathave and I'm the founder and CEO of The Digital Economist, which is a global impact platform focused on building the knowledge, product services and programs towards human-centered and planetary-centered outcomes. So we have a, a fantastic group of panelists today, uh, Anu from the State of Women and Christina, who's joining us. And we'll go into the introductions um, just in a second, but we're gonna be talking about the new digital economy, what that means, what that entails, what does that mean for women? Um, and as an economist, uh, I am very biased towards um, towards that new digital economy. And I would say on the onset, uh, I hold strong opinions on uh, particularly the role of women in, in building that new digital economy. So I'm very excited to welcome you all today. And uh, yeah, Anu, why don't we start with you? Tell us about who you are, what you do, and um, what do you care about in the new digital economy? Absolutely, so I'm Anu Bardwaj. I'm the founder of Women Investing Women Digital. And over the course, which is a uh, global digital media platform focused on women investing, and we, for the past 18 months, we've been focusing on blockchain, AI, and deep tech. Um, for the purposes of the pandemic, I've been working on a suite of podcast apps that have blockchain technology embedded on the back end. So we were working on Sheikonomy apps, where you can listen learn and earn tokens and it's female focused female centric 300 podcasts english spanish chinese and last year when we all met in at the world economic forum um after shortly after um i cashed out my daughter's college fund and decided i was gonna educate 900 million girls instead of that one that i have so we we basically created this podcast app for those girls that don't have zoom zoom school google classroom what do they have and how do they learn and how do we not compromise the next generation of women who don't have literacy because of this global situation that we're in. So our solution was looking at a podcast space and giving them an opportunity to create their own content, but also be incentivized for it. And we ended up um, applying for a grant from the Islamic Development Bank, won the global, global COVID solutions competition out of 5,000 applicants. There were 30 winners, seven women-led teams, and we were one of them. And so with the money that we, we put together, we got the apps built on Android, iOS, and a new platform called KaiOS, which works on $20 mobile phones across Africa, Asia, Latin America. And so we said, instead of making tech that works for us and maybe it'll scale to them, we said, let's make tech for the bottom billion and then see if it will work for us. And as of this Saturday, Christina, I'm announcing it here at the summit first. We just signed an agreement with the United Nations to take our apps into refugee camps in Bangladesh so that the young women and girls can not only listen and learn, but they can also produce their content and share it with the world. So that's what we're working on now. And I see tremendous potential because once they're generating tokens, they can invest, they can spend, they can save, they can donate, and so can we. Remarkable, Anu. Thank you for sharing that. What a what a shaker! I'm really um, I'm really <laughs> taken aback by cashing out the college fund part uh, in in a good way. And so, so you're really a leader who's putting her money where her mouth is. And you know, I, I think it's a great inspiration for all of us that we can start um, wherever we are. Um, and I'll come back to a whole bunch of things that you said around content, the digital, the token. No. Yep. Um, but Christina, over to you. Um, curious to learn about a little bit about your background, uh, what you're working on currently, and what does new digital economy entail uh, for you in your understanding? Sure. So I, um, I currently work in the aerospace world. I've been working in space for um, 12 and a half years. I was an accidental space person. I used to run a media company. Uh, production company, radio show, record label, all of that. And then I, no, no, sorry, children trying to come in here. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and then I, and I started working in space and it was an unexpected thing um, running the world of Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin and rebuilding his brand, revitalizing like awareness about him globally and making people understand that he was always looking towards the future, even though he was famous for walking on the moon 50 years ago, that he was really 
always looking to the future. And so one of the interesting parts of that is that that meant I always was around other people looking to the future. Uh, people like um, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson. And all of these people are very invested in the future. When when people, when I talk to people about money and, and, and the future of money or investment, I always say to people, pay attention to who's investing in space because they are thinking about the future. Um, I was a part of an event several years ago at SETI with PayPal, where they were already committed at that point to being the first digital um, uh, currency in space. And it's starting to become more of a reality, um, the idea of commercial, more commercial missions, more people going and living in space. It's going to be happening in the near term. And so everyone involved in that world is also heavily involved in blockchain and cryptocurrency. And that I, you may have seen last week that Elon Musk was on SNL and he was just going crazy about, I don't even know how you say it. Is it Doge, Doge coin or Doge, Doge, uh, but uh, however you say it, but I know that he's a big um, supporter of that. So anyway, um, that that's how I'm kind of involved in it because everyone I'm dealing with is dealing with the people. Tina, well, you're <laughs> you're you're a, a space superstar. So um, I, I think how, how fascinating that is, sort of the intersectionality uh, with the digital economy, but but also sort of what the future holds, and and of course, space is uh, currently such a such a hot area, um, right? And 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 by the way, Christina, that's Dogecoin, Dogecoin, uh, and <laughs> started out as a joke. Um, but uh, of course, Elon Musk jokes a lot, uh, and uh, so it's interesting now, uh, kind of looking at the space where cryptocurrencies are are going, which is of course the first sort of use case. Um, and so, I knew, you know, Christina talked about you know tokens in space, so this is fascinating, and and I want to just sort of turn this over to you a little bit, just to kind of take a step back and give a little bit more context to the audience, uh, right? So. Um, when we think of the digital economy, we think about the World Wide Web, right? We think about all sorts of applications built on the internet. We think about perhaps payments. We think about digital money, um, right? And so we're now looking at sort of the next wave of sort of decentralized architecture. And for those who are not into, for example, cryptocurrencies or NFTs at the moment, how would you sort of like bridge the two worlds. So if I'm like 11 year old right now, what would you say well, we should care about? Oh, I know I think you're on mute. Wonderful. So I have a 10 year old happens to, you know, I have like, we started this conversation when she was seven and she started crypto for kids. She's like, we need to make it simpler. I want to understand it. And I had taken her to a blockchain for impact conference at in St. Kitts. And that's where Roger Ver hangs out. And he's with Bitcoin.com and <clears throat> um, is an investor in many Bitcoins blockchain startups. And he was giving a talk and she's like, Mom, I want to see what you're working on. You're building this wallet. It's taking you forever. What what is this thing? And I showed her my, you know, like prototypes and everything. And she's like, actually, I'm gonna go on YouTube and Try to figure this out myself that's what kids do they go on youtube now to learn and so she goes on youtube and she's like this is so boring like they've lost my attention in the first five seconds i don't get it i don't understand it so i said come to the talk and let's see you know you can figure it out so she's sitting there and you know he's talking talking and then finally i looked over i'm like aria what what is he saying and she's like mom it's um digital bunny you can buy things from amazon and then they'll ship it to your door that's what it is and it was like the most eloquent explanation of what is this crypto, right? She's like, it's just digital money. Can I get a wallet? That was the next question. Where can I get a wallet? I, I got a bunch of stuff I want to buy. Do they make kids wallets? I'm like, no, no such thing. And she's like, well, maybe that's where you should start. Maybe that's where this conversation needs to begin. And now we have things like Roblox. I don't know if your daughter's playing with Roblox now, but it's like, once they go through all the games and it's like, mom, can I get like something for my unicorn or whatever? And it's basically crypto. 
It's basically what it is. And that's where it begins because then they get used to buying Robux and guess what Robux turns into? The row tokens, you know? It's like simplifying it for a child. It's like you've gamified money. You're buying things with it and you don't need to have cash anymore. Why do you need cash when you have a QR code? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I think you're really stressing tokens as uh, a way to exchange value in some sort. Um, but I guess I would refrain a little bit from sort of completely calling it money because I think in this case it's uh, collectibles, and then of course there's a sure. onboard and and offboard with uh, with fiat currencies. But uh, I think that's spot on. I know in the gaming world this is very well understood. Uh, when it comes to digital collectibles. And I guess you're seeing that interest pouring in the NFT yeah. space currently, right? Um, sure. And which is very different from sort of the conversations with banks, uh, particularly central banks, right? Or governments that are really looking at more the back end, the technology itself, uh, the cryptography, right? The transparency, the efficiency, the settlement speed, and what have you. So I think, I guess, to each one their own. Um, so, uh, Christina, over to you now. Uh, that was a that was interesting reminder of why we're doing this conference. Um, actually, uh, you know, with with kids in the background and and how important it is to <laughs> um, to build a more inclusive world, right? And that's sort of the the reality and um, that uh, that we need to include more than uh, more than anything. Uh, so that was a, a fun little thing. Uh, but Christina, so you talked about sort of the tokens and space and, and, and use cases around that. So would you sort of agree with Anu here that, you know, when it comes to sort of the new digital economy, we're really looking at, you know, blockchain and tokens and wallets as sort of the primary driver, or is there more to add there? Well, I think, you know, it's still a little ways before that becomes the standard, but I do agree with her that my kid, my daughter plays Roblox and for her, it is just totally natural to pay for things digitally. Like actually having physical money is like a novelty, you know, right. for kids now they do everything uh, online. Their whole world is online. It's the natural, um, uh, way that they operate in many ways. Both of my kids have touchscreen Chromebooks, and that's Chrome? just the natural for them. Chromebook, uh, touchscreen Chromebooks. And, you know, at, at my age, we had nothing, you know, of course, like that. And, and so, I'm, but, but even still, even I don't use cash. Even I only do use digital money always. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think it's um, becoming the norm. I think that there's still a little bit of resistance to the crypto world in some circles because it does feel nebulous, like not real money in some ways and not everyone takes it. That being said, some of the adventures I've been doing lately. Um, so for instance, I offer a lot of uh, space themed or um, really, really world changing adventures like going to the bottom of the ocean. And uh, even even those people, see I've got a child trying to creep in again, even those people are, are willing to take um, crypto for payment now, which is not something that would have been accepted like a year or two ago. There you so go. Interesting. Uh, what you're saying is yes, this is the reality <laughs> that that uh, <laughs> that everyone has had to live during the pandemic. This digital world, everyone's getting more and more used to it. And I'm sorry, he's. We're gonna get him out of here because he's in his underwear. Hold on a moment. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> interesting. I, I just love pandemic. It's it's like. <laughs> um, you know, Absolutely. You told me you are on in Big Island. You're you're like uh, you're living in Big Island. Are you are you by a beach where you are? Uh, very close, Anu. Uh, I am. I want to say more cliffside than sort of the sandy beaches one thinks of. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah. And so Anu, you know, just to kind of come back here to what Christina said yeah. about uh, payments and accepting crypto. Um, I'm curious to hear sort of. You know, where are we ultimately going uh, when it comes to the the digital economy? And again, I guess I have a take on this uh, yeah. uh, from, I guess, the, the digital economist perspective. Yeah. Um, 
but I'm very curious to hear what your, you know, um, your focus is on are we ultimately making technology that is cool, that's efficient, that sort of caters to, I guess, the new wave of um, uh, needs as they evolve um, for, for our species on the planet? Is it to, uh, you know, to what you're working on, which is sort of the bottom one billion uh, what what would you say is sort of the 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 end game here? So I I kind of feel like we're moving towards a rewards economy. Like it should have like we're we're talking about it slowly. You're kind of seeing it like whether you go to like food stores or whatever. But they're like yeah, now you have rewards. Now you have cash back. Now you have even Apple Pay and things like that. Like we see payments uh, like a new wave. And I'm like well, you guys could have done this a long time ago. You're worth a trillion dollars. How are you worth a trillion dollars? It's because you weren't doing cash back. And now people are like, yeah, you can slice this and cut that and, you know, like build value for people that are using your tech. And that's what, how it should be the standard, not the, not the incentive, but the standard. And I think we're moving in that standard. So part of, we're talking about rewards economy, Christina. Um, and so I like the way that I envision this is, yeah, you've got a Spotify, yeah, you've got iHeart, and you've got Pandora, and all these people, they take your data, they, they charge you money, actually, to use their service, and it's a great service, no, no question about it, but ultimately, there are people that can't afford 10 bucks a month, they, when they're living on $2 a day, they can't afford 10 bucks a month, they can't afford a data plan, I mean, please, you think they're going to get a $1,000 phone in their lifetime? No, so ultimately, it's, it's reframing this and saying, Yes, we're going to compensate you. And then we have to make it so simple that are you going to get credit cards with your like, you know, minimum, whatever, how do we get cards in their hands? And will they be digital cards instead of like handheld cards? Could they be QR codes, you know? So ultimately, I think we're moving in that direction of first giving them some identity, giving them some place in the world, like you actually exist and we actually think you're bankable. I mean, yeah, let's give them that dignity. Start with their identity and then give them their dignity, maybe. And from there, let's talk about the economics and the money and, and where this is all going to go. But it all starts with human value. Talking about all this other value that's out there, that's wonderful. But if I don't even value your life and you, that says something. So that's why we're going down to like the bottom. And I think the pandemic is forcing us to really think about that. Like, it's not just about me anymore. It's about them. And once we get that equation, the, the economics are going to completely shift and how we do business, how we, how we not only define value, right? It's all going to change. That's what the new economy hmm. is. Yeah, and I think you, you really touched upon, I know some really core aspects. Um, I like sort of the stress on content, which I think is a primary driver for a lot of businesses, if not almost all of businesses in sort of the digital sphere, um, unless, you know, you have a, a certain service, but content sort of remains the core. So kind of starting there, giving voice, uh, just kind of even to share your own story, uh, right, to to girls around the world is, is so important. And then you talked about digital identity as a starting point and financial and digital inclusion. Uh, sort of starting there and then you know I have so much to kind of say and add in terms of you know the platform economics of it like are these people plugging in at a certain platform who owns the data right um, is uh, is uh, you know data being compensated for if they are voluntarily sort of like opting in uh, we've done a whole bunch of work at MIT Connection Science on these data consortiums there is a consortium called Trust Data um, and I'm a fellow with uh, the the Connection Science Lab um, at at the larger Media Lab, and a whole bunch of discussions, including at the World Economic Forum, that ultimately became the GDPR. Um, so privacy, of course, is the other big thing, right? So when we're looking to include the next, uh, the final billion, then you know, uh, are we going to just you know perpetuate the same system, right? That brought us to this point and this level of inequality. Or are we looking uh, at better systems uh, from from the get go? And what does that mean, right? And even if they are part of it, what's sort of the next challenge? Is it um, is it uh, just including them? Um, for example, a quick data point would 
would be in Philippines, in the Philippines, or I've, I've, somebody told me people, and particularly the young people, spend up to 10 hours a day on social wow. media. Wow. And I was taken aback. And of course, I mean, I guess it probably wouldn't be incorrect to say like this part of the world, we probably spend easily three, four hours, five hours as well, if you kind of look at all social media platforms. Uh, but just like on Facebook alone, which, you know, again, is probably helpful in terms of some small business use cases. But if it's just sort of scrolling, then, you know, I was generally thinking, like, what about the skill sets, right, of the youth around the world? Uh, will they have the skill sets to uh, engage in a meaningful way and not just be consumers or just data right. generating touch points for companies like Facebook? Um, or are they helping build sort of that, that new wave of technologies, which for me is really kind of uh, the, the new digital economy, right? Um, and so, you know, just, just open-ended, I guess, questions and commentary. And Christina, feel free to jump in here. You, I think you're, you're talking about use cases that really kind of at the cutting edge, it's like beyond the planet too. And so on the other hand, I, I see this interesting dichotomy here where Anu is talking about sort of bringing the, the final billion, holding them into, into the digital economy. Um, so, you know, I think the truth is somewhere in between the two. So any comments from any one of you? Um, uh, very curious to hear. So obviously being in the space world again, you know, it's everyone's thinking about the future um, and future technologies, everything that relates to that. Um, I will say that it's still a very, very male dominated world, you know, so there are lots of programs that are meant to include women and people of more diverse backgrounds, but there does still seem to be a bit of a, um, an awareness gap or an access gap um, to getting into it. So, you know, everybody says they're really committed to bringing more people in, but I'm not sure they're doing that great of a job yet here, at least in America. I will say the one place that I have firsthand seen a really drastic difference is in the UAE. The UAE has made a serious commitment to educate uh, their women in the space uh, economy. And about six years ago, six, seven years ago, when they launched the UAE Space Agency, um, and we had many meetings over and over and over, I noticed almost every time we met that the room was dominated with women. Wow. And I finally said, what, what does everyone do? And they said, well, engineers. And, and it was a surprise. You know, I wasn't, uh, they, they were all in the room. There was a woman always leading the, the meetings. And there was a point where one of the ministers, when they were um, announcing just some, some of their uh, projects for the coming year, had at that point, that was about four years ago, said that 70% um, of their engineering grads were women in the UAE. And so at the UAE Space Agency, the, the uh, split is about 50-50 of women and men. And so I asked them about this. I said, how are you doing this? And they were like, it's not like this everywhere. It's not like this in America. I'm like not even close. Yeah. And so they said, that, but this is a deep government um, commitment to getting women involved, especially in the aerospace world, because they look as, at space as the future. As I mentioned in a, a, the, other, the panel I was in yesterday, you know, they basically said seven years ago, in 15 years, oil will be dead. Oil will be done. We have got to transition now. We have got to take this seriously and start looking to towards um, future uh, energy uh, uh, options, clean energy, and, and space is the forefront of that. And so they saw the opportunity there. They've actually committed to a city on Mars within 100 years. And they're dead serious about it. And they've committed the funds and they have a plan. The interesting thing about that is, you know, the digital economy. I mean, how more digital could it get living on another planet, you know, and how they will be living. But the interesting thing to me about it is that they have made a whole shift in, in the way that they operate as a government. And I think, you know, that almost has to happen here in the U.S. as well. Um, and I do think that maybe this administration is trying to drag us into the new economy with clean energy and a, and a new infrastructure. Hopefully that will change. I mean, one thing that when you travel a lot, 
it took a long time for the U.S. to even get credit cards that had chips in them. Like, you know, they were doing the tap, tapping their credit card on things, you know, way before, years before us. And it was such a foreign thing for me as an American to go to, to anywhere in Europe and have to actually sign my credit card slip. You know, that was crazy to them. So I think that, you know, the U.S. is kind of behind in that way, but, but hopefully you're going to start, um, start catching up with the rest of the world, or at least the, the parts of the world that are committed to a digital economy. I think it's inevitable, though. I mean, whether or not people feel comfortable with cryptocurrency, I, I think it's an inevitable thing that everything will become digital and we won't have physical money anymore at some point. Absolutely. So I, and I think, go ahead. Anna. No, 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 please go. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to summarize that. Do it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I think, um, Christina, I think you, you touched upon some really interesting pointers. Uh, this is remarkable, by the way. I did not know that about UAE. So I, I think, and it's funny because I think in India too, um, the the top talent that sort of emerges is uh, is females, but then you don't see that reflected in the workforce. Mm -hmm. And you know, the question is, what happened? How did it disappear? You know, um, and I think there are more than one factors. But I was reminded of this article that I that I read. I think it was right after Biden and. Harris got sworn in, um, or right before, and why this is, you know, the first female vice president uh, still after, you know, 200 years or more. Uh, and the article said America has produced daughters it can't tame. Uh, so it's, I think it's, uh, it summarizes uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of what we look at, you know, uh, kind of holding on to some traditional notions. Uh, and yet, you know, there are the people like yourself, Christina, here, who are products, if you may, of this economy, are educated here and are work here. Uh, and, and, and the rest of, of course, the top talent the U.S. draws, but there's definitely systemic barriers. But it's interesting, I think, what you mentioned about um, the digital economy as well. One, obviously, from an economics perspective, it's a given that the digital economy is going to be a lot bigger than the physical economy. Um, and of course, there's the argument of digital abundance, which is mm -hmm. not tied to physical scarcity. Um, again, sort of the way the economics of it works out and whether it's, you know, for example, fiat currencies are no longer pegged to gold, but they were, right? And and now we're looking at the, the debt ratios that governments have, but you know, that's kind of going out of the window. $10 trillion or more were you know, added to the global economy um, with, with the pandemic and, and, you know, in terms of the, the fiscal stimulus. So um, with sort of all of that said, uh, you know, the digital economy, you know, I, I think uh, from what we're seeing here um, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And one of the things that keeps emerging is inclusion, inclusion of women, inclusion of those who have not been included so far. And that pretty much is, is, is an umbrella term. And the fact that it's looking into the future. So industries that are looking into the future uh, are the ones that are the drivers of, of the new digital economy. So those are kind of just, I think, a couple of um, uh, quick insights that sort of becoming clear as, as, uh, as we, you know, chatting today. But Anu, go ahead. I'm curious to hear, uh, you know, what you are about to add here. I was going to say that for me, you know, this, 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 this goes beyond the crypto. This, what we, what we're building, there's some very sophisticated AI and some machine learning that we've been working on. And, you know, it's not just, um, the, the tokens that are generated. It's what kind of content are they listening to? Is it health related, entrepreneurship related, in, innovation related, investing? And when the pandemic happened, and you see this happening in India right now, it's like, who's getting the information? Are they getting the information? They can't read, right? And this is part of the problem. They don't have a TV. How do you mitigate, not just COVID, but you've got breast cancer, cervical cancer, you've got all these other public health initiatives, and you've got broken healthcare systems and so on and so forth. So when we initially designed this app, it was like, 
how do you stop the spread of COVID when you have large numbers of women who run households and now you're going to see orphans, right? Because they didn't get the information in time. And this is the reality. So ultimately, there's got to be public health and in, in, in interventions, innovations. And we saw this as a, as a way not only for education, but also public health. And it's primarily to get the data that the World Health Organization needs, the Ministry of Health, the hospitals, the caregivers, and so on and so forth. So ultimately, the algorithms that are built in, what are you listening to? What are you reading? Right? And what kind of content's being created? That's one frame. So Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, World Bank, IMF, IFC, World Economic Forum, we're all making policies. They're not working. Why are they not working? Because you don't have the right data. Where are you going to get this data? You're going to get this data from the AI, the ML, you know, and it goes so and so forth. So I would say um, we have to be thinking very, I mean, we have the tools. We just have to put it together, get it out there and have people using it, the adoption. And then you get the better data from, from this. And when we talk about the digital economy, we have a way forward. And this is why, you know, what we're saying is you want the data, you can get the data. It's just going to take you a little bit of time, get your subsets. And then with, you know, uh, what is it? The, the geolocating capabilities, the Google analytics and things like that. I'm not creating anything new. We have all of this. So let's just look at the sociographic data and the demographic data and then run it from there. And, and we can get better policies and programming. Who is this going to help? At the end of the day, it's going to help women and girls because that's where we need to start. Um, and then this other component is um, I'm also looking at satellites. That's how I got connected to this whole space world and where we're drawing this blockchain and space and AI and whatever. Because ultimately, my refugees are going to be in these areas of the world where they may not have Wi-Fi. They may not have great connectivity. And I'm like, hey, how do we get them connectivity? You know, like lands will only go so far. We got to be thinking space because maybe there's going to be some innovations for them. I mean, we're talking about Mars and so on and so forth. We've got people right here on Earth that can't get the tech, you know. So now I've got to start talking to people like Christina to say, hey, you know anybody at Starlink? You know anybody at, you know, wherever that's got satellites, you know, for social good? Like, that's what I need right now because we got the tech. We've got to get the data. That's, that's the tricky part. Right, right. I think that's that's spot on. Uh, in fact, I know it's um, it's so timely because um, uh, Alex Pentland he just uh, published a book on data as the new capital uh, for the digital economy, 100%. and and we wrote yeah, and and we actually recently wrote a piece on sort of you know what does that mean from a human centered perspective, which is sort of the mission of the digital economist. Um, and one of the things that sort of stuck with me, I'm not the first author on that report is that data is both the fuel as well as the exhaust of the digital economy. You need the data in order to provide a service Correct. to ensure inclusion. But Correct. at the same time, then what comes out of it, we have to be very cognizant of that, how we um, care for it, how we ensure privacy, uh, not to abuse it, I guess. Uh, sort of the first wave of uh, you know um, innovations which have been using it uh, without sort of any real oversight right and only now i think governments are starting to wake up to that and and i guess again to christina to your point we see that us is obviously not you know uh, driving a lot of this change uh, you see a lot more adoption when it comes to digital tech in asia uh, you know in singapore switzerland way ahead in terms of regulatory clarity and also i guess the just the structure of uh, of the state is is a bit of a hindrance, uh, right? As as a as a, a federation rather than uh, a union. So you you know you have a, a very fragmented uh, ecosystem of regulators that you know are uh, trying to do different things at different paces and figuring it all out. And and it's obviously a challenge from a from a more innovation perspective. I know you have anything to add here. Um, yeah, so I think that the, the data for the government standpoint, yes, this is always going to be regulated. Um, and this is where it got very interesting, like, you know, working on, on this project, we're just getting started with the United Nations. Ultimately, what we're building is a tool to enable them, because ultimately, we're going to need new tools for measurement. This, that's 
that's that's where this is all starting. The governments don't have it. They've got other priorities right now. And like you said, it's $10 trillion additional. They've got their own problems. So it's, it's up to entrepreneurs like us right now who are going to come up with these solutions to say, you know what, maybe this will help you. Maybe this will work. What do we have to lose? What do we have to lose is some other child is going to become an orphan. Some other girl is going to be trafficked. Maybe her parents will marry her off. That's what we have to lose. So now we're in this situation where we have this window, this golden opportunity to go out there and do something, get the right data. And you're going to see sandbox mechanisms coming up. And it's up to us to just, you know, take that chance, you know, jump right in and close our eyes and pray to God and hope it works because that's all we have now. That's, 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 it's, it's hope. If anything, it's hope. And it's better than not having it. Right. So that's the way I see it. And I need some satellites, Christina. <laughs> so interesting. So over the weekend, I did this zero gravity flight with astronauts, um, which was just a fun, adventurous <laughs> thing. But, um, there were several guys on our flight who have an AI company, which was so interesting to me. And what their AI does is actually predicts where they need ambulances. And I was like, really? That's your business, huh? But, you know, that's when I realized how much AI is really driving the way that we live now, you know, and helping to basically analyze where, you know, populations, maybe maybe elderly populations are starting to, you know, maybe they need more ambulances in that area because of the growing uh, aging people in that part of the world, or maybe there's a lot more, uh, accidents that are happening in certain areas. It was just a very fascinating thing. But what it seemed that these guys also seemed to be involved with was also helping with um, human preventing human trafficking. And so they had a big fundraiser just before they came to our gala about that, talking about the ways that they were trying to help use their AI for that sort of thing. Um, so there's obviously a lot of really amazing applications for so many different types of AI, you know, that can help uh in, in many ways not just money but just quality of life that sort of thing as far as the satellite things go you know starlink will be very interesting it's very controversial because you know he's putting he's planning elon's planning to put thousands of satellites in orbit um which is an interesting thing to be able to provide internet access to parts of the world like you say that do not have access to it do not have the infrastructure it's not built in they don't have the cabling <laughs> It's just very, you know, people who live very, very far away from access. So in that way, I think it's really great, but it's also a little bit um, makes everyone nervous with uh, collisions in space and the amount of satellites that are going up there and the space debris that we have and all of that. So that's that's a bit of worry now, too. So there are a lot of companies who are beginning to look into creating um solutions for that. There's a little company called Starfish that my friend Jennifer is part of that I they've actually they're launching well what their what their company does is and they're doing a test with spacex in june is they're going to launch this space tug and what the space tug does it goes and fi finds um uh dormant satellites that have been damaged or might need some repairs so that they can try to salvage them the ones that are already in orbit to make them work to help save it and then if they can't save it then they actually try to tug it into a way that they can um, actually retrieve it somehow and bring it back to earth and recycle the components and stuff. So this is very interesting, a lot of the um, technology in the satellite and orbital technology world going on right now. We just need a few. <laughs> I'm thinking <laughs> it starts with like one or two and see if they work and then see if this, you know, it's like we're still in experimental mode and, you know, it's like one step at a time, you know, save one girl at a time if we can. But ultimately, it's uh, it's that chance that we're ready to take. And now, I do have to tell you, I went to Nepal about four years, five years ago. And what, what I was struck by leaving Kathmandu going out, out of the city is it wasn't like the third world. It was like primitive. You know, it was people living in in huts and with their goats in the hut, you know, in the hut and the oxen carts and no paved roads and all of that. But what struck me was as we went out to this event and there were thousands of students out there, they all had a smartphone. 
And I thought, wow, this is really kind of amazing that they live in these conditions that they don't have running water or electricity in a lot of these huts, but they all have a smartphone. My first thought was, where are they charging these things? <laughs> Number one, uh, maybe they're using solar panels. I don't know. But um, so that's the interesting part to me is that even in the rural areas, you know, they are using satellites in many cases, even yeah. in places where they don't have. The so we're already there in many ways, but. I Oh no, we're losing her. Navroop, are you there? Yes. I'm here. Yeah, I think, I think we lost Christina for a second here. Frozen. There we are. There you go. I never um, lost you guys. <laughs> okay. Well, you froze for a minute on our end. I see like, little bars on your screen. I see bars on your screen too, Navroop. Like two bars. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. I think, uh, Christina, yeah, it's interesting because I think. Both of you are talking about also just the way the physical and the digital worlds collide. Um, and to your point, Anu, um, there are very real implications and ramifications if we do well in the digital world and what we can do with it um, to make the planet a better place for humans and hopefully other species too. Um, you know, and, and, and the use cases that, that you're referring to. Um, and it's interesting because I was just reading uh, this book, I finished actually listening to the audiobook by Mariana Mazzucato, who's, a, who's an economist. It's called Moonshot Economy. How do you apply uh, the thinking of uh, a moon landing throughout the book to, you know, saving the economy, essentially? <laughs> um, and I would totally think this is like perhaps like the reference book coming out of this session perfectly combines the physical the digital the role of the government the role of private partners and Thanks. public uh, exactly the particularly the public private partnerships model that work very well when it comes to you know the the US uh, landing on the moon um, but yeah um, I think uh, this is this has been an absolutely fascinating panel I'm curious to hear if there are any last thoughts insights you want to leave the audiences with before we wrap up? Um, I will say that, you know, the, the real solutions that are going to take us forward are the ones that are cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary, and we have to start thinking, uh, like really pushing ourselves because um, it's, it's like, what is it, the saying five steps backwards and 10 steps forward or something like that. It's like we've now taken a step back and this is our time to slingshot and go forward. And it's not just developing economies, leapfrogging. It's like right here at home, there's a lot of work that we could do. There's a lot of things that we do well, but we can do a whole lot better. And now we're going to learn from these developing economies. So I think this whole paradigm is about to shift where it's like, yes, because they're smaller countries, they'll have less regulation barriers and hurdles, and they're, they're going to be in a position to fly fly off the charts and radar. So keep an eye on the emerging markets, keep an eye on these small countries and don't don't get bogged down in the regs because that's what's gonna hold you back. So really start thinking, you know, um, to move forward, you're gonna have to think outside of the box or maybe there is no box. And I will add, since you brought up Moonshot, um, so a lot of people don't maybe realize, and this is something I'm trying to help raise awareness about, is that the next missions to the moon are meant for 2024. That is three years away. NASA has the Artemis missions, uh, twin sister uh, of Apollo, goddess of the moon. And this is real. I mean, I was at NASA uh, Kennedy Space Center a few days ago with astronauts looking at the rockets and the hardware that will be on the first uh, Artemis mission. And it's something that I think will really inspire women and girls. It's meant to put the first woman on the moon. And the, the reason I bring it up is because all of the innovation that really um, was jump started was because of the first moon landing. It really like forced us to develop new technologies, invent new technologies that had never been invented before. Mm -hmm. The other part of it is that people don't realize that going back to the moon isn't just a bragging rights thing. The whole point of going back to the moon is because many countries are looking at it for resources, for ice, water, to turn it into water, turn it into rocket fuel, to create a fuel depot around the world, and to actually get resources from the moon so that we don't have to use as much from Earth. Um, there's a lot of 
really, really big world thinking in terms of like space-based solar power and trying to do energy off world so that we don't have to use as much on earth. And so the, the whole point of the Artemis tie of it to me though, is that it will hopefully inspire women and girls to see a place for them in this, in this next, in this next uh, evolution and, and innovation that will be coming out of this. And hopefully if it's done the way that, that the Apollo missions will, it, it'll create the game changers and the women could be the game changers of tomorrow, like the people who are changing the world today. So Christina, our next summit is in June, and I would love to get more people from Artemis to speak at that and where we are and what they need and and have have more of a deep dive. So June 22nd, I'm gonna call on you for that. And let's, let's, right. do, it. let's do it, girl, let's do it. All right. <laughs> um, well, thank you both. I think this is uh, the perfect note to conclude the session at. Um, which is that the future is female, the future is collective, the future is inclusive, and the new digital economy must reflect that. And with that, thank you very much for joining us. I am Navroop Sadev, and uh, we were joined today by Christina and Anu, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank Thanks you. All. Have a good night.